of the Free American. I'm your host. I am Clay Douglas. My guest today is Andrew Mangione. He's from the Association of Mature American Citizens. He works with Dan Weber over there. He's been on my show a number of times. And, uh, and more and more Americans are realizing that the uh, AARP does not represent their values well AMAC does. Hello Andy, how are you? I'm doing well, Payne. Thank you for having me. My pleasure, sir. How long has uh, AMAC been going now? I, I recall doing shows with Dan <coughs> Weber over ten years ago. Well, uh, we'll be seven years old in June. Oh, okay. uh, we came into being in uh, June of 2007. So seven years, ten years, it probably feels like ten years. But, uh, it does for me. Uh, we will celebrate our, <laughs> our seventh birthday in June. All right. Well, congratulations. Happy birthday. Uh, you're doing, uh, I believe, from the information that I've been getting, you're doing pretty well. You've got uh, quite a few people signed up. Is that right? Yes, sir. Uh, AMAC is now at 1.2 million dues-paying members across the country, and I qualify that by saying dues-paying, and that there are some other organizations that claim to be doing what we're doing, but uh, in reality what they have is an email list that they're calling quote-unquote members, or a petition that they're calling quote-unquote members. AMAC members have forked over their hard-earned money to this, and we're proud to say that they reside in all 50 states, and we are adding thousands of new members, uh, dues-paying members, every week. That's uh, that's uh, great. Now, I do this show. I've been doing this show for 25 years, and uh, talking about the uh, new world order. I, uh, I'm sort of an equal opportunity basher. I, 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 frankly, I can't see much difference between our Republican and our Democratic administrations. But uh, two wings of the same bird is the way I refer to it. Uh, but uh, we've got there's uh, there's on the mainstream we're hearing uh, quite a bit and even especially on the internet about Obamacare. They uh, people don't seem to believe that's very good for us elderly Americans. And I'm getting up there in uh, age too. What's going on? What's uh, what's what's happening in America today? I, I see I see a sinister side to things. I see uh, what happened in the Soviet Union happening in America. You know, we're talking about a regime that killed 60 million of its own citizens, and with the treatment our veterans are getting in the hospitals, with the treatment our elderly are getting, being put in the old folks' home, putting to be being put in these hospitals, fed medication that. Uh, I think does more damage than it uh, does good. What's 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 the outlook from your point of view, from AM to AC? What's happening in America? Well, I, I, uh, it's funny that you mentioned that you didn't see um, uh, too much of a difference between Republicans and Democrats, and uh, I hear that a lot, Clayton. And I, I do would like for you to keep this in mind. Why? While AMAC is a nonpartisan organization, we are a conservative group, but we're nonpartisan, and we define our nonpartisanship as uh, not endorsing candidates or contributing to campaigns or PACs. I'm pretty sure that if uh, we had a Republican administration, if we had a McCain administration, and I'm not endorsing John McCain, if he had beaten Obama, that we, we would have never seen anything uh, like Obamacare, or I would venture to say that you would not have seen anything like Obamacare from a Republican administration. That said, 
uh, we do have Obamacare, and what's happening uh, is, is that it's, it, it, it's, it's kind of festering, and uh, the, the points that have, uh, have allowed to be uh, implemented uh, and not delayed are, are slowly but surely destroying uh, one of the greatest health care systems in the world. Our members are gravely concerned over the effects uh, Obamacare will have on Medicare in particular. And it's no secret that uh, $700 plus billion plus has been backed out of Medicare Advantage to pay for Obamacare. Uh, it's clear that this administration is going to pay for a lot of Obamacare on the backs of its senior citizens. And as an advocacy group, uh, one of the most egregious under the radar, Clayton, happened in January of this year when Health and Human Services cut 14% or $22 billion from Medicare home health care. Home health care, this is not somebody coming to your place to uh, dust and clean and help you get dressed. This is a hospital in a home. The average recipient for Medicare home health care is about 84 years old. They're a minority. They are uh, two-thirds live below the federal poverty level, and they have chronic diseases. And the administration cut uh, approximately $22 billion out of home health care over the next four years. So these folks who are, uh, whose health is compromised, who are poor, will have limited access to vital health care. But to demonstrate, you know, yes, what's going on, the effects of Obamacare on the economy are starting to show up. Ninety percent of the businesses that provide Medicare home health care services are small businesses. Now, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid took a look at this cut, and in their own estimation, they say that 40% of the businesses that provide Medicare home health care services will be insolvent or out of business by 2017. So 500,000 jobs and 5,000 companies will be wiped out in order to fund uh, subsidies on the health care exchanges and expand Medicaid. And this, this is... And this is just one cut to Medicare. Uh, so it, it's, uh, Obamacare is, is festering across the land. It's killing jobs. Uh, it's compromising the, the health care for seasons, uh, senior citizens and mature Americans. And it's only just begun. Parts of it haven't, uh, you, know, the, you know, specific parts of Obamacare have been delayed until after the election. So we haven't even seen the, the true effect of, of Obamacare in, in whole. Uh, but what we have seen so far is uh, frightening. Um, people are, are losing physicians, people that have had trusted relationships with doctors. We know that we're hearing from our members uh, that uh, uh, with regard to the Medicare Advantage plans, doctors are uh, thrown out of networks. Networks are shrinking. Services are shrinking. Provider networks are shrinking. So uh, it, it, the effects are beginning to show up, particularly with our demographic. But for the population as a whole, I think we're going to be in, in for a rude awakening in terms of uh, the full effect of Obamacare uh, after the midterm election and when, when uh, the president finally allows the law to be fully implemented. The uh, Who does Obamacare benefit if it doesn't benefit the people? Now, keep in mind, I am not, I, you know, the, you heard my little commercials there. Some people consider me uh, controversial because I'm not a very big fan of our medical industry, I figure that the uh, doctors and the pharmaceutical companies don't make any money off of you if you're healthy. <laughs> and and the fact is, uh, if you I, I did something kind of unusual this last year. I actually watched the Super Bowl on television. Every other commercial was for a drug. Now, I've checked into the pharmaceutical company markups on uh, things like Luvox or Valium or uh, any uh, some of these psychotropic uh, drugs that they feed our veterans who have developed a conscience. And uh, the, the first half of the commercials tell you the contraindications. Well, this could cause sterility, this could cause insanity, this could cause death. Why would anybody want to take that medication? Who's uh, why are we our doctors feeding our elderly? And and I know this from firsthand information. My mother had a triple bypass twenty years ago. She uh, went to the hospital. I uh, it took me a while to get back out to uh, Texas. 
I went to, uh, she was in a nursing home then, and uh, I went to see her. She couldn't even talk to me. I went to the doctor. I said, what's wrong with her? What's wrong with her? This isn't uh, from the operation. This isn't from the bypass. Well, we, we, we feed them drugs to uh, keep them quiet, keep them comfortable. And I said, well, you're not feeding her anymore. I'm taking her out of here. And so she lived another five or six years. A pretty productive, communicative life near me. And, and so I'm not a very big fan of this whole medical uh, uh, association and this pharmaceutical association. More people die from pharmaceuticals than all the heroin, cocaine, and methamphetamine, and marijuana in the world. What's going on? What is, who does Obamacare well, benefit? <laughs> If not just well, you know, uh, the, the, that, the, the great question, okay, why is the president doing this? Certainly, uh, he has stated that uh, it, it's just, you know, when, when the debate began about health care, it started out as making sure that uh, 10 million, 12 million, 30 million, 40 million, that number always changed. But that, that they were trying to identify people that did not have insurance and did not have access to health care, and the president wanted to help them. And then, it, then, and then Obamacare evolved, the debate evolved into health insurance reform. And instead of just addressing the segment of the population, and keep in mind, at the time Obamacare was being debated, 85% of the people polled, of people polled, said they were satisfied with their current plans and their current level of health care. The president decided to, to uh, I, I, you know, instead of addressing the segment that did not have access, he decided to tear down uh, the insurance industry, essentially, and remake it. Why? Uh, now he'll tell you uh, to lower costs. Remember, he ran around the country saying that every family would save $2,500 uh, a year uh, with Obamacare. You can keep your doctor if you like it. You can keep your plan if you like it, period. That's what he was saying. None of that proved to be true. And I think it's plain to see that it's the president's intent to lead us to a, payer, uh, a single payer system. I think that is intent to have a centrally planned health care system like we see in Britain, like we see in Canada. This is, you know, and, and people will, will, uh, will draw comparisons to the Canadian system. There's only 30 million people that live in Canada. There's not 300 plus million like that live in the United States. So I don't think it's a fair comparison. But uh, in my opinion, and you're asking me for my opinion, Clayton, I think that the, the, the intent here was to lead us to a single-payer system with government control, with the bureaucrat in every exam room across the country, getting between you and your doctor, and thus getting in between you and your health care. Um, the let's just take a step aside from the medical Im implications. Uh, AMAC is about more than just medical care, isn't it? I mean, I don't go to doctors. Yes, sir. I don't go to doctors. I don't. Uh, I. I you know, very rarely I do have, I do have uh, Medicare. I guess I think I had to, uh, I had something in my knee go out and uh, had to go get a pill or something from. Uh, uh, and so I was in the system for a while. And ten years ago, I was in, the, I was fully immersed in the whole medical system. They kept me drugged. Ran up a three-quarter million hospital bill, dollar bill, for a motorcycle accident. There was no accident, but uh, they uh, three three-quarter million dollar for three broken ribs. Three months being drugged into total oblivion. Got no memory of two, three months in the hospital. And uh, certainly the uh, brain damage they claimed I have. I don't think that's uh, very apparent today. Matter of fact, I was told by an investigator, I have the most well recovered head injury patient she's ever seen. I said, Well, maybe I wasn't quite injured quite as badly as I thought I was. But again, I'm no fan of the hospital system. What else does AMAC do? Now, you, you mentioned Obama. We've got the controversy coming on that he's not even eligible to be president. Uh, he's also uh, asked uh, for a I think it's fifty billion for a war on terror, and I've told people 
I, I think you've got about as much chance of being killed by a terrorist in America as you did getting eaten by a great white shark in uh, Phoenix. What about this? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, that's a good one. Um, you know, AMAC came into being seven years ago to provide an alternative to AARP. Um, for many, many years, over 50 years, or you know, probably uh, 45 years at the time, uh, 40 plus years, there was only one group that ran around and told everybody that they represented every American over the age of 50. And they started out with the most noble of intentions. But it's no secret that they've taken a hard turn to the left over the past 20 years. And a lot of people in the country do not identify with that direction that AARP has taken. Uh, the biggest betrayal that our members, who are former members of AERP, that they tell us was their AERP stance on Obamacare and how they ignored their membership and endorsed the, uh, the, the law uh, without you know, paying absolutely no attention to their members. Calls were actually coming into AARP's uh, leadership, uh, 14 to 1. This is calls from their membership, 14 to 1 against supporting Obamacare. And we supported it in any way. So we came into being to provide folks with an alternative to AERP, a conservative alternative, folks that believe in the Constitution and guard it as the most significant document ever created by mankind, folks that support the Second Amendment, folks that, folks that support religious freedom. We're not a religious organization per se, but we certainly support your right to worship wherever you want to without being hassled by any federal or government mandate. We support free markets and free enterprise. That's who we are. We tell you that up front. And uh, a lot of people identify with those values and those principles, and they were happy to find us. Our business model, Clayton, is very similar to AERP in that we do offer member benefits. We do. We're asking people to send us a check for $16 to join AMAC, and we have to give them something of value in return. So you can get insurance products, you can get roadside assistance, you can get travel discounts, etc., from AMAC, very similar to what you get at AERP. But I assure you, sir, that is where the similarities end. Our advocacy, and that's my department, I'm the one who goes to Washington on behalf of our members. Our advocacy is purely driven by our membership. They dictate the issues that I bring to Washington. We engage our members on a weekly basis. We poll them. We, uh, we have newsletters that go out. We have our magazine that goes out. We have online forums uh, on our website at amac.us. We also have a Facebook page where we engage our, the AMAC community. So we're in constant communication with our members. And we know the issues that matter to them because they tell us. And we present those issues in Washington. So we are a member-driven organization. We do not manage from the top down. Uh, our members drive everything they, that we do in terms of advocacy. They are with us every step of the way. We developed a plan that uh, makes Social Security solvent for 75 years that you can find on our website, Clayton. But our members had input in it, and they had a say in the final document. We polled our members on components of the plan. So they're very, they, they are our partners. And the moment we stop listening to them is the moment AMAC ceases to be. So, you know, we've learned a lot from AARP. We've learned a lot of what not to do. Now, we know that we're, uh, we are up against an iconic brand and, a, uh, and, and a, uh, an organization that's been around for 50-plus years. But, you know, so far, uh, we've added 1.2 million dues-paying members to AMAC, and we firmly believe that we can build AMAC into a 20 million member organization. That is our goal. That is our mission. And we're listening to our members every step of the way. So we work hard to differentiate ourselves from, from AERP, and it's not that difficult to do, honestly. We ask our members. Uh, we we uh, listen to our members, I should say, and we act on their concerns. That that is uh, probably the, the you know the, the the biggest differentiator between AMAC and AERP. And we are grateful to come on programs like yours to let folks know about us. Uh, we don't you know we're a self-funded organization. We don't have a benefactor, although we have been accused of having a benefactor. We do not. We self-funded. Uh, we every dollar that comes into AMAC goes right back out to build the membership. So we don't, you know, we don't have the budget to do a multi-million dollar branding campaign on Fox News. We wish we did. We don't. So we do a lot of direct mail. We do a lot of 
uh, email blasts, a lot of Google campaigns, a lot of radio interviews, you know, to get the word out about us. And uh, the word is spreading. People are talking about us. People are joining. People are telling other folks to join. But again, you know, our guiding light uh, is our membership and our individual members uh, at uh, 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 relate to us, their concerns, and uh, we talked a lot about health care, and as, as you can guess, that's a, a great concern. They're, they're concerned about their children and grandchildren and what kind of country we're going to leave to them uh, with $17 trillion in debt hanging over our heads. So well, let's, uh, let's talk these are about the issues that. that we're bringing let's, to Washington. Let's talk about that for a moment. You know, again, uh, you know, I've been branded uh, radical, I've been branded anti-government, I've been branded uh, racist, uh, bigot, every, anything, any nasty name you can think of. Because I interview a lot of people, I tell you, I present all sides of it, of all of the arguments. I talk about all those things you're not supposed to talk about in public, you know, religion and politics. And uh, <laughs> I also helped start when I started this radio show. When I started this uh, my magazine, I started the militias in uh, in the state of New Mexico. Now, they tell you that like it's a bad idea, you know, my, my answer is fairly simple. What part of the Second Amendment don't you understand? And if you're going to tell people I started the militia, you might tell them I did it in the governor's office. Wasn't exactly a terrorist organization. Wasn't exactly a radical organization. And right here in Texas now, I'm back in Texas after about a 45-year self-imposed exile, the militias are starting, and uh, they're doing it in the sheriff's office. We we work. Uh, if you start a militia, it's just a uh, it's like uh, a posse. It's just like uh, deputizing. You work for the you work for the sheriff of your county, and uh, you know to me that's that's people taking care of people, looking out for your neighbors, working with your neighbors, starting from the ground up. We we've uh, funded. Uh, we we've, we've set up. Uh, County uh, county websites, so people uh, can can get active and work on uh, politics on a local basis. And one of our what I consider our enemies is the whole uh, Federal Reserve, you know, one world government of the bankers, by the bankers, and for the bankers system. This is what our country was. Uh, founded on, our founding father, Thomas Jefferson, warned us, if you ever allow a private bank to issue your money, the banks and the corporations that spring up around them will leave your children homeless in the land we conquer, first by inflation, then by deflation. What about a, what about AMAC? What are we doing now? There are states that have taken action. North Dakota has its own state bank. There are organizations out there that are trying to make people aware of uh, that. Uh, you know, Kennedy issued Executive Order 1110. I've got one of his five-dollar bills in my pocket. You can't find them anymore. They ain't around. Got a red seal on it. it says long top United States note. What about AMAC? I mean, are you, are you aware of the whole? Fractional reserve banking scam. Do you consider it a scam? And uh, what about your membership? Do they are they aware of this? I think that uh, it, it hasn't been brought to light. It hasn't been brought to our attention. Um, you know, when, when we talk about individual states, a lot of our members are jazzed about the uh, convention of states, and we haven't come out with an official position on that. But as far as what you're referring to, Clayton, um, our members have been. Uh, it hasn't been brought to our attention as a concern. Well, <laughs> consider me standing on the bridge like wave, wave, waving the flag here, but. <laughs> It's, uh, you know, when your founding fathers warned you about something and then you go ahead and do it, you know, I, I, I study, I, I am on the board of directors for Timothy Bible College and the Little Red Schoolhouse, sort of an alternative, uh, call it an advanced uh, education system, basically based on uh, homeschooling. You know, why not, you've got the... Yeah, we've got access to all the information in the world right here on my computer. Why should I go into uh, 
a brick building somewhere and sit there and be indoctrinated rather than educated. What about our education system? Is is the AMJC members? I mean, I learned to read. I learned to read sitting on my grandfather's lap. He would read comic books to me, Superman comic books. He'd run his finger over the uh, over the words as he read to me. And so when I went into the first grade, I could I could read faster than a sixth grader. Right. What uh, What about our education system? Are you, are are the the grandparents today are being shuttled off to nursing homes, fed drugs? My mother and grandmother were drug addicts. I didn't know. I didn't know until I was twenty years old right. and went in and took one of my grandmother's sleeping pills. Woo, Granny! Wow. I thought you were just people. I didn't know you were taking reds. I didn't know you were stumbling around on reds. Second all. Uh, so so. What's about what about our? Uh, you, we're a lot of us in, uh, that are eligible for your organization. Our grandparents. I want to be able to read to my grandchildren. I want to be able to play, watch my grandchildren play. I want to be able to educate them. I want to be able to pass on a little bit of the information I've gotten. Forty nine states in forty nine years, wandering around the country. What about our education you know, system? It's, it's it, it, it's, uh, you, you bring up a great point about our educational system. Uh, one of the things that we do at AMAC, Clayton, um, we hold AMAC member-only town hall meetings with various members of Congress in their local districts across the country. And on May 3rd, we were in Sun City West, Arizona with Congressman Trent Franks. We had 110 AMAC members come to this town hall meeting. And it was fun. It was, there was a lively exchange. It was mostly question and answer. But right at the end of the town hall meeting, we had a Marine who was an AMAC member who served in Vietnam. This gentleman lost his father in World War II when he was two years old. And he stood up. And he, and he just and he talked about the education system. He talked about how people aren't being taught how America was founded on Judeo-Christian values in public schools at least and and as you know the vast majority of education in this country takes place in public schools uh, and how people aren't taught the Constitution they're not taught how important this document is why it was created and what a tremendous there, there has been no other form of government in the world prior to the United States being formed and the Constitution guarantees our rights as citizens and limits government. That hadn't been done before. That's not being taught. This Marine, this, this guy broke down into tears about his country and, and his frustration with the current attitude of, of younger generations. And he likened it and pointed to the educational system for not doing their job in the proper education on the formation of the country, what the founding father's intent was, how important the Constitution is, and how there's just a complete lack of regard for Judeo-Christian values, which were the very values upon which the nation was founded. Uh, it's a very timely question, Clayton. Uh, what's going on is that people aren't being educated, at least um, in, in the public school systems. Uh, again, bureaucracy and politics and agendas have invaded the classroom, very similar to how you have that bureaucrat in the exam room now with Obamacare. And, and what's great about America isn't being taught. Um, uh, you know, I, I was listening to the radio. I was running some errands yesterday, and when we talk about American exceptionalism, our liberal elitists, um, you know, friends, if you will, will tell you that we have no right to consider ourselves exceptional. But they're missing a the point. The Constitution and our form of government that we created and the freedoms that we have makes us exceptional, makes America exceptional. We don't think we're better than anybody else, but we have more freedoms, and that gives us an opportunity to be exceptional. And that's not, is, is what is not being taught in classrooms today, which I think caused this, this Marine, this veteran stand up and break down in front of 110 strangers about what he feels is going wrong with his beloved country. How did Trent react? I I, uh, I know Trent. Matter of fact, I, I've ridden with him. He rides a Harley, and so he can't be all bad. <laughs> he walked up to him. It was the last question, uh, and 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 first of all, he had the microphone in his hand. He acknowledged uh, the veteran, uh, the our AMAC member for his service in Vietnam, 
and he walked over and shook his hand, and uh, people clapped. It was very moving. It was a fitting way to end the discussion, but he acknowledged that man for the patriot that he is. Well, you know, I started the militia and this magazine and this radio show after what happened at Waco because I swore I would never sit back and watch something like that happen again on television without trying to do something. I'm trying to do something right now. You know, this is not, uh, and and I, I think what we're up against, because I've been demonized and tried, they've tried to sideline me, they've tried to block me, they've tried to limit uh, my access to people, this radio show's access to people. They've tried to do that, and uh, I, I think uh, it's because I am, these people are opposing our Constitution. Now, with me it's real simple. I volunteered for Vietnam. I took that oath to defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And I, uh, I don't see too many domestic enemies in Vietnam. I don't see, uh, or I don't even see foreign enemies in Vietnam, Iraq, Iran, Libya, where we just had Benghazi. My guest yesterday talked about a gun running to Benghazi. Uh, I see more domestic enemies than uh, than we do have foreign enemies. You know, when we invaded Iraq, there uh, there was no weapons of mass destruction. When we invaded Vietnam, there was no Gulf of Tonkin incident. So we've got bankers funding both sides of every conflict. They're they're funding these wars, and they're sending our veterans, our young people, off to go fight when there's no enemy. They're sending them off to be killed and. More uh, and it's uh, it's very upsetting to me that more of my brothers that did go to Vietnam have committed suicide when they since they got back then were killed in Vietnam. Uh, that's to me that's a national tragedy. How do we yeah, compete I think with when you look at the, the yeah, I I would agree with you the, the the way that veterans are treated and and the resulting ailments and and uh, uh, just. Uh, the, the resulting, uh, I, I, I'm looking for the word, you know, the, the, the resulting effect that the wars have had on them and, and, and uh, their actions as a result of how they're being treated when they get back is, is just deplorable. PTSD. P PTSD is simply a name that the pharmaceutical companies gave to a disease that doesn't exist. What we're talking about are veterans that have a conscience. I believe. This is just my opinion, folks, but, uh, you know, I do an awful lot of study. I talk to an awful lot of veterans. I talk to a lot of bikers. I talk to all, all classes of people. I've been in presidential elections. I've had, uh, I've represented and uh, worked with presidential candidates. They wanted to stop the Federal Reserve, and as a result, you weren't allowed to know about them. Every, every Charles Collins is a, was a close friend of mine. He died a couple of years ago, and uh, he ran for president back in 1996, and every time Charles got up to tell people we could buy back the Federal Reserve, every cameraman on stage turned the cameras off, took a smoke break, pointed the cameras at the ground, so nobody in the Republican Party knew Charles Collins was running for president. They did pretty much the same thing to my friend uh, Gary Johnson, who ran on the Libertarian Party ticket. So if, uh, if our media controls what we know, who we know about, you know, there's not doesn't seem to be any solution in trying to vote somebody in. You know, I met McCain. I, uh, you know, I met uh, I met Bob Dole. I met I met Pat Buchanan. I met a lot of these uh, candidates, including Alan Keyes back in '96. I mean, if, they, if we were going to vote in a black man for president, we should have voted in Alan Keyes. And if uh, you know, and if uh, the elections had not been somewhat rigged, Pat Buchanan would have been president, by, uh, Alan Keyes would have been vice president back in 96. If the media is being controlled and the Rothschild banking system did buy Reuters in the 1890s, what do we do? Where do we turn? We've got you, you actually, you found the answer there. You're reaching out, you got a million and a half people. 
And you didn't reach him on NBC or ABC or CBS, did you? You reached him on the internet. Um, no, no, no. You go ahead. You, you uh, I didn't mean to interrupt. You can finish your point. Well, it's it's just that our media is being controlled. But we, there's a. I think right now there's a lot of hope out there. We've actually had the technology for a hundred years to turn this country around. We, uh, we, we. And we've got one state that's uh, now you can grow hemp again, which was our number one cash crop back in the 30s, before they stole it. So, and and six states, six states. Uh, you've got a, a company called Bright Farms that uh, is now growing organic foods, organic vegetables on the roof of their supermarkets. So when you go into this chain of supermarkets in, in six states, you go into a chain of supermarkets, you can get vegetables that were grown uh, and picked that day. Non-GMO foods. So I, I think there's a lot of hope out there right now. We found that we, the U.S. Navy has discovered that they can power their ships from the water they float off, <laughs> you know, they don't have to have the gasoline. They don't have to go back in port to buy uh, Rockefeller's gasoline or BP's gasoline. And we're also finding that uh, solar panels that they can they can pave our roads with solar panels that will charge our electric cars while we're running. We've got a lot of opportunity out there. It ain't making it to the ABC, NBC, or CBS, the mainstream. It ain't making it there. Yeah, unfortunately, it's not. And and what's unfortunate, while while uh, I think that ABC, NBC, CBS, New York Times, LA Times, Washington Post, et cetera, et cetera, um, have lost their monopoly on the news, they are still very influential. And and this administration, I think more than any, has has brought to light and has has really made people aware of the classic low information voter, you know the people that watch NBC, CBS, and ABC and think that they're informed, people that listen to NPR and think they're smart. Um, these are the folks that lap up what's being fed to them and run to the booth and vote for Democrats and vote for liberals. Like and the, and, and the result that we have is. Uh, President Obama and his policies, and Obamacare in particular. Um, uh, the you know, if you look at you know, I mean, you know, the, the right owns talk radio, and and uh, the right has Fox News. That's about it. Uh, there's a lot of blogs, and there's a lot of new media uh, that that has chipped away at the uh, the quote unquote mainstream media, and that caused them to lose their monopoly. But they are still very influential. And I like the fact that uh, the RNC chairman is considering not having debates on NBC just because of how biased and, and, and to the left uh, unabashedly uh, that network has become. And I salute him for, for making a move like that or for making a consideration like that. Well, there are honest people both in the Republican Party and the Democratic Party. But, you know, they don't call television programming for nothing. It's they they really do use it. I mean, from from Edward Bernays, uh, you know, making it okay for women to smoke. You know, the uh, they are controlling the way we think. They're controlling our perceptions. And again, my uh, my friend Charles was uh, you know running for president in the Republican Party, and yet no cameraman on stage ever allowed his message to get through to the common people. And in some states, I had to go out and print a speech up and uh, print it up at uh, Kinko's and bring it back and distribute it to the uh, to the members of the Republican Party because they unplugged this microphone. Two states that I was in. Obviously, we've got in domestic enemies within both parties. Domestic enemies within our our Congress and our Senate, you know, it may be that uh, since we lost the Thirteenth Amendment, the real Thirteenth Amendment, 
that banned uh, titles of nobility from uh, holding office, the uh, lawyers went out and took over. And um, who's <laughs> who we got to blame for that? I mean, the Bar Association, that's the British accredited registry. So we've got our former uh, masters, you know, running our, our political system now. No separation of powers. If there, if all, if all your legislators, all your judges, and all your presidents, and all your congressmen are lawyers, we don't, uh, we don't seem to have a, a, a good choice. So occasionally, you, one of them slips through, like uh, Ron Paul, a doctor that uh, had a positive influence on our political system, in my opinion. And uh, this is. It's funny, well, you know what, um, back uh, when, when the nation was formed and representatives were first being elected, there were a lot of physicians that were elected as uh, members of Congress and, and, and senators. And Dr. Ben Carson brought this up. Uh, I saw him speak at CPAC uh, last year and this year. And he said, that this is what we need. He goes, I'm not going to slam lawyers, but, you know, physicians bring a different worldview to, to the table when it comes to governing and when it comes to representing people. And uh, he was advocating. I mean, a lot of people want the good doctor to run for president or some kind of elected office, and I, I don't know if that's his intent or not. But he made a very good point in saying that, you know, you, you, you know <laughs> lawyers are trained to argue, and they're trained, to, they're trained for conflict. And, and when we look at the situation, the environment inside Congress, and is it any surprise that it's so confrontational? Uh, back in, in, in the early formation uh, of, the, of the country, you had uh, a different type of politician, and he was advocating a return of that different type of politician. In other words, elect more physicians, and they do bring a different perspective, don't they, Clayton? Yes, sir. I, I come from a little different uh, standpoint. I think we ought to elect bikers. But <laughs> well, why, why not? Uh, well, how about Americans? Let's start Ameri there. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We, you know, you, uh, so many of us are soldiers. Veter veterans would be another great candidate. You know, it was our veterans that uh, upset coup attempts on the Americans. St uh, Major General Smedley Butler upset a, a attempt to set up fascist government with, uh, I think that was uh, our last President Bush's uh, grandfather, Prescott Bush got indicted for trading with the enemy and then of course you had generals like uh, Patton that said we fought on the wrong side of World War II they killed him for that what about veterans? I mean veter veterans seem to be uh, they, they are certainly being mistreated the, so the VA is is uh, constantly under uh, criticism here on, on my end of the, the information flows across my desk. I think we need more veterans running for office. And I, I've tried to set up uh, little villages using low-cost housing, whether it's teepees, trailers, or, uh, uh, or sod houses, or adobe. You know, two classes of people live in adobe houses, the very rich and the very poor. And if, if we just work together, I, I came up with my what I call my Liberty Village plan, grow your own food, grow food in your backyard, not grass, folks, and, and put solar on your house so you generate your own electricity from what God gave us, don't pay the power companies, and house veterans. And then the veterans can be there to support you, to protect you, to work with you. And we wouldn't have homeless veterans. We wouldn't have veterans uh, being drugged into oblivion in uh, some of these uh, Obamacare type hospitals. You know, you, you uh, the veterans and their issues is an important plank in AMAC's issues uh, advocacy platform. Now, I know that Monday was Memorial Day, and this is very timely that they have this discussion. A lot of people, I would venture to say, do not realize that America is protected by 1% of the population. 1% of, of people and their families are making sacrifices to keep us safe and to ensure that we're free and to protect our freedoms. Uh, I think Ed veterans would make wonderful, wonderful representatives of the people in both houses of Congress. And uh, in my time on Capitol Hill, I have run into a lot of members of Congress who are veterans. 
Uh, they bring a different perspective. Uh, they understand how to follow orders. They understand the need for order. Uh, they understand their priorities are generally white, where they should be country first, and they're very selfless people. And when we talk about the VA, uh, you've brought the, the VA, uh, the systemic problems that are facing it, that are riddling it, uh, wait lines, people dying waiting for care, people not even on wait lists for, for Hold care. Hold on just a second um, here. Hold on uh, just a second here. I've, it seems like I've got some kind of problem here with my... Uh, Let's hear it with blog talk here. It's, uh, we had a connection problem. Phil, are, are you uh, able to hear me on here? What's going on here? It said the host disconnected, but uh, it looks like, uh, let me, dis uh, let me, uh, let me check on that just a second here. Welcome to Blog Talk Radio. To start your show now, press 1. Since it appears you're calling back into a live show, we are reconnecting you now. Alright, don't know quite happened or what happened here. Maybe we were making too much sense. But uh, let me, uh, <laughs> maybe let me uh, double check and see if I've got another... Uh, if we're connected on this one here. Five, six, one, nine, seven, three, five, eight is busy. You can leave. All right. Now we got Cruise Radio hooked back up again. Looks like uh, looks like we got Crusade hooked up. And uh, my guest, Andrew Ahmed Baggioni. Andy, you're still with me, right? I am. Okay, we got it all hooked back up. All right. Well, I don't think we lost much. We don't, didn't lose much. We were just talking about veterans running for office. And uh, this, uh, this Memorial Day, we not only had... Uh, veterans there. We had bikers there supporting the veterans on Memorial Day. The uh, MIA POW Roland Thunder, uh, which I've been promoting and supporting for whew, 20 years at least. They uh, they showed their million bikers in Washington, D.C. A, a lot of people standing on the corners waving flags and saluting the bikers who were saluting the veterans. So that's the kind of uh, that's the kind of spirit and that's the kind of people that make up America. Now I filmed uh, years ago, I did a film, and maybe this was uh, one of the reasons they tried to kill me, Andy. I filmed the first Homeland Security meeting after we had rolled FEMA into the Department of Homeland Security. Colonel John Brinkerhoff was lecturing law enforcement in Albuquerque, New Mexico at Sandia Labs. And he was trying to tell them, uh, we're in uh, for a war. We're in a long war. And uh, this war is going to be fought on American soil, unlike other wars. And, and it might go on longer than the Cold War. And the enemy is weak. The enemy doesn't have planes. It doesn't have helicopters. It doesn't have tanks. So they're going to use unconventional methods. And in case of a single outbreak of smallpox in a major metropolitan area, an atomic attack, or an earthquake, or a natural disaster of significant magnitude, we'll need 400,000 well-armed, well-trained, organized, disciplined troops to control the American people, because some of them just won't follow orders. And a veteran stood up and back and said, well, you know, Wait a minute, you know, I'm Special Forces, man. We were trained to go into a villages. We were trained on how to take, uh, uh, show the people how to take care of themselves, how to survive, how to, how to organize, how to defend themselves. Why not just send the Special Forces out across America to the small towns and to the farms and teach Americans how to take care of themselves, how to be self-sufficient. They didn't, I don't think they liked that. They didn't like the, um, you know, and I tried to tell them, you know, some of us, some of us, you're right, men, some of us ain't going to line up on a 
Walmart parking lot to get a vaccination for a disease that's been eradicated, uh, that's going to give us a disease that's been eradicated, mild case, mild case, that's where the vaccines were, that's been eradicated in this country for a hundred years. You want to vaccinate me for smallpox? I don't think so. Now, that when we had 9-11, I saw Americans helping Americans. I didn't see anybody looting uh, other than the gold they stole out from underneath the World Trade Center. But it wasn't looters that did that. And we had policemen and firemen working together to try to save people, you know, that uh, that have been pretty much uh, had their health decimated by what occurred there. I mean, people don't even realize we uh, those buildings were brought down by atomic weapons, not planes. What uh, what about that? What about the the this whole this is uh, again this was an excuse like the uh, Lusitania like the uh, Gulf of Tonkin this was an excuse to take us into a war that the bankers made money off of and of course the uh, corporations like Halliburton that rebuilt what we bombed and what we destroyed they made a little bit of money off of it but I don't see the uh, I don't see the advantage to the Iraqi people and I don't see the advantage to the American people. What can we do about this? I mean the veterans is a good <laughs> idea. I think that's a great idea. But how do we how do you we know, educate I think people? You know, Clay, now I, I don't know. <laughs> Talk about various reasons for, for 9-11. Um, you know, we're, we're a senior organization that advocates on behalf of our members. A lot of our members are veterans. A lot of our members own small businesses or want to pass on those small businesses to their families. A lot of our members are concerned about their financial futures uh, with regard to the $17 trillion in debt that we talked about. A lot of them are concerned about their health care. These are the issues that they're bringing to me. Uh, these are the issues that they're bringing to us to bring to Washington. Um, you know, and, and, and we cannot take the spotlight, nor can we take our eye off the ball when it comes to veterans. Uh, if you look back to the first Gulf War in uh, 1991, oh, um, those folks now are entering ages where they're, they're, they would be AMAC members, late 40s, turning 50, um, going back 20 plus years, you know, 23 years. Uh, and, uh, you know, if they, were, if they were 20 plus years or younger, uh, they're, they're, they're entering a situation where these people are not going to be considered as mature Americans and uh, would be interested in joining an organization like AMAC, and they're going to have health issues, maybe as a result of what happened to them in that first Gulf War. Uh, but um, these are the issues that we're focusing on, uh, and we think, you know, we need to apply pressure to the administration uh, with regard to veterans and their issues, particularly what's happening at the VA. Uh, you know, when the president held his press conference last last week, it was a, a, just a complete joke. He acted outraged. He acted like he was concerned, and he immediately ordered an investigation. Well, we've already have some preliminary reports that show rampant uh, incompetence and rampant cover-up at the VA, but that's not enough to convince this president he wants more information before he makes a decision. Uh, or before he acts. And it's just another stall technique. It's, it's true to form. Uh, act disgusted, act outraged, order an investigation, and hope this thing dies and goes away so we can focus on domestic issues, further domestic issues, remaking America into the likeness of what he thinks it should be. Uh, these are the issues that we're focusing on as an organization. And this is, these are the issues that we're hearing from our members that concern them. And that's, that's, that's really our mission, Clayton, is, is to listen to our members, bring their issues to Washington, find solutions to the problems that uh, are concerning our members and, then, and that are facing America. That's what AMEX all about. All right, now I've got something up here. We've just got a few minutes left until our station break, and I believe you'll be leaving me then. What about this contest to create a new fitness program for seniors? I'm pretty concerned about that. I need more exercise. I spend way too much time at the computer writing and uh, doing these shows. What about what's this fitness program that you got? That's uh, that's well, the headlines thought, on my site. <laughs> Well, we, we launched a, uh, a uh, you know mid May a couple of weeks ago. We launched a contest. Um, you, you know, you, you know, we we think we believe that uh, preventive medicine. We believe that being proactive about your health will lead to a better uh, and more productive retirement. 
And there are uh, all kinds of data, as everybody knows, that shows that keeping fit will keep these chronic diseases at bay, diseases that are particularly associated with aging, like type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and even Alzheimer's disease. So we wanted to offer an incentive um, by rewarding our members who come up with ideas for making it easier to live healthier and longer lives. So we're offering a $1,500 first prize, a $1,000 second prize, and a $500 third prize for people who can create lifestyle games that folks can play that incorporate mental and physical exercises to stay sharp, not only mentally, but physically. And, you know, we're looking for brain teasers and light workouts for seniors, people that, you know, uh, you know people that are in, in the golden years of their life, and we're looking for repetitive type of activities. So, um, you know, th that said, we thought it would be fun. People have all kinds of ideas. Everybody knows the relationship between good health and exercise. And we want to uh, take it to, um, you know, and, and focus on our demographic, the 50-plus demographic, uh, because this is where these chronic diseases show up as we age. You know, the longer you live, something's going to get you. But if you remain active, you keep the blood flowing, you keep your mind stimulated. For example, it's been shown that, Say you're a reader, Clayton. Say you've been reading books. You read a book a week your whole life. That's great, but your brain gets used to it. Uh, so do something different. Maybe at this point in your life, it's time to learn a musical instrument or a foreign language. These are things that you haven't typically done throughout your life, but when you do them later in life, they can studies show that these types of mental activities have been shown to stave off Alzheimer's disease. So we're looking for those types of, uh, we're looking for uh, unique and uh, just looking for folks to share what they've been doing to stay sharp mentally and physically. We're offering, a, 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 you know, a, 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 thought it would be fun to have a contest and offer some incentive for people to participate. Well, that's great. I, uh, I'm going to have to uh, I recommend uh, getting a Harley, you know. <laughs> but... <laughs> Uh, if you're riding in L.A. or Houston or Dallas, uh, you know, that'll keep your brain sharp. It's called defensive driving. I just operated on the on the idea that every phone I use is tapped and everybody in the four wheel is trying to kill me. kind of keeps me alert. All right, Andrew, we're out of time here. Thank you for being on with me, and I don't envy your job dealing with the bureaucrats in Washington. But I appreciate somebody doing that. Uh, thank you for having me. It's my pleasure to be here. Thank you, sir. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye. Okay. All right. All right. Let's... Uh,